This video is sponsored by the Naval Institute Press, a division of the US Naval Institute. Watch until the end to discover how you can get 25 to 40% off their entire book collection. The question you might now be asking is, not a Schweinfurt video, really? There's like hundreds of them. You know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I haven't made one on Schweinfurt just yet, but you are right. There are hundreds of them. But I don't think there is any video like this one. And by the end of this video, I think you'll agree. We know about the famous Schweinfurt raids, specifically the ones where the United States Army Air Force lost around 130 bombers over two days in August and October 1943. The overall story of these raids is well known, as are the direct reasons for it, that being the attempt to deal a knockout blow by targeting the German ball bearing production. I want to dig deeper and explain to you why Schweinfurt was inevitable. Not because of the target or the circumstances or because of what exactly happened on those missions, but because everything in the United States Army Air Corps and Army Air Force was working towards this disaster since the 1920s. Yeah, I know, it's a big claim. Hear me out. So let's go back to the 1920s before moving over to what all of this has to do with Schweinfurt. World War I had just ended and the aircraft became a new weapon in the arsenal of every major power. And in the US, the 1920s were a turbulent time for air power. Facing external and internal opposition, the founding fathers of strategic bombing established strong theoretical, organizational and technological foundations that helped weather the storms of the pre-World War II environment. Although strategic bombing was still largely a theoretical exercise during World War I, it rapidly matured into a doctrine and then to a war plan. Or, to put it more bluntly, the Army's heavy bombing doctrine was based on a number of terribly flawed assumptions that had been formed under the idealized concepts of air power in the early 1920s. Initially, much of this focus was on defending the US coastlines. Just remember Billy Mitchell's fight with the Navy on that, or the interception of the wrecks. But the focus on heavy bombing soon took a life on its own, as the doctrinal and educational institutions that would, of course, shape the perceptions of many future officers started to really manifest themselves. Advocates of the Air Corps' tactical school quickly seized on the new capabilities to proclaim that the bomber was becoming an unstoppable force. This meshed neatly with the new emphasis on developing air power theory, not constrained by the current budgetary, technological or political restraints. This openness to new ideas spread like wildfire throughout the Air Corps and helped move strategic bombing theory to the early stages of what would become an accepted doctrine. This is also shown clearly with the release of the bombardment doctrine by the training school, which developed from the mid-1920s. Physically and cognitively, the Air Corps' bombardment doctrine as laid out in the bombardment aviation text explained that the basic function of the bombardment airplane and its equipment is to effectively transport and apply destructive agencies upon material objectives. Upon this task are based all requirements. Of course, this opens the chicken and egg question. What comes first, doctrine or technology, or is it a synchronized process? I'm gonna be pushing that question aside for today because of this video's scope, so let us focus simply on the outcome. There are two main points to remember here. First, we have to focus on the intended destructive effect of air attack that was to carry the day in favor of air power. As the United States Army Air Force's own official guide to the Army Air Forces, published first in 1944, sets out, the most effective method of waging war was to destroy the enemy's weapons while they were still in production, thus rendering him powerless. Air power capitalizing on its inherent long-range strategic capabilities and operating in sufficient strength could accomplish this objective. Beyond that growing focus on delivering a knockout blow comes a technological focus by which the attention is funneled into a system to deliver the intended results. Accomplishing these tasks would require a purpose-built system of humans and machines, the structure of which developed through the 1930s. The evolution of their thinking can be traced through the successive instructional text used in the bombardment aviation class taught at the Air Corps training school, which laid out the Air Corps' preferred method of employing bombardment forces. Once you are on that trajectory, you have a path dependency. This is not unique to air power, nor the Army Air Corps, Army Air Force, and then the Air Force as such. 
nor can it not be challenged or changed by both internal and external pressures. Yet the technological and doctrinal assumptions and then beliefs that were set out as self-evident by the air power advocates in the 1920s and 1930s would then lead on directly to the disasters of Schweinfurt. I think no one sums it up better than Tammy Davis Biddle in her absolutely must-read book on strategic bombing. The near-catastrophic failure of the RAF and later the United States Army Air Force to make good the pre-war claims with their new methods cannot be explained by looking at the methods and the equipment alone. This failure lay fundamentally in the process of learning and perception in which the larger environment conditioned thought in powerful and ultimately very problematic ways. To understand the history of strategic bombing does require an understanding of the process by which these ideas took form and the influences that molded them. And that now brings us to Schweinfurt. The Schweinfurt attack was the culmination of 20 years of air power thinking. In the light of a struggling progress, the strategic bomber offensive looked towards finding that, that key component in the German armament industry to bring the war A to a swifter end and then of course B to prove that the assumptions of the air theorists were actually correct. Just as the B-17 represented independent air power to the training school's disciples, Schweinfurt represented the pinnacle of target selection for air intelligence. Both symbols, the B-17 and ball bearings, were tied to the same theoretical doctrine that prescribed victory through air power. Both the US Committee of Operation Analysts and British intelligence sources concluded that anti-friction bearings represented a potential bottleneck in the German war economy. During this process of identifying the key target, whether it was oil, ball bearings or grinding wheels, the committee followed the assumptions of air power. Even when aiming to gather data by speaking to industrial experts, the conclusions were as expected. To COA members, whose organization's survival was by then all but assured for the remainder of the war, securing support for their research was a matter of pride. An opportunity to attack grinding wheel plants would also reinforce the agenda to seek out the catastrophic raids. If successful, quick victory could be attributed to COA's collective genius along with General Arnold's omniscient view from Washington. The committee found the expert they sought and he provided the opinion they expected. Unfortunately, as with ball bearings, the analysts pushed to attack grinding wheels would perpetuate the tendency in Washington to overestimate the bomber's ability to attack such targets and to underestimate the Germans' ability to cope. It's important to recognize that Schweinfurt could have been absolutely any city or any target or any mission. Its relevance lies by the fact that ball bearings were identified as the most valuable target to strike, so they were struck multiple times. Pair that with the fact that, let's say, the make-believe prowess of the bomber did not really overcome the fighter, and that it lay outside of fighter cover, so Schweinfurt did, uh, that makes it into such a tragic event. But the target itself could have been anything. Schweinfurt worked as a symbol of ideal target selection for the following reasons. It served the interest for quick victory, the COA's interest proving their organizational expertise, the intelligence division's interest in forming an air intelligence enterprise down to the unit level, and Schweinfurt appeared to be linked to the overall political objective of the war, unconditional surrender. The problem with Schweinfurt, like the B-17, was that the symbol itself needed to prove worthy of its marketing value. As long as Schweinfurt maintained its plausible linkage to victory, whether such victory actually occurred, then all battles might be won. As I'm citing out of all this literature, you're probably interested, what are these sources? Well, I have a couple of them here that I would highly recommend you to read. So we're starting with Rise of the War Machines by Raymond O'Mara. That is this book that came out relatively recently and it explains how a single crew member all the way to the bomber formation was created in America. So this sort of human system or human technological uh, system that was created really really cool read to explore how exactly that was done we also have another of course all-time classic tammy davis biddle uh, rhetoric and reality in air warfare 
and of course then also the origins of American strategic bomber theory by Craig Morris. Uh, these two books here and of course also another highly recommended book from my side is uh, Selling Schweinfurt by Brian Vlaun where he looks into the origins of the missions, the discussions surrounding that, how they happened, what happened, who stood on what side of the fence and why Schweinfurt became the compelling target that it was for the United States uh, at that time. Also, these two books, The Rise of the War Machines and The Origins of Strategic Bomber Theory plus Selling Schweinfurt are all 25% off with my exclusive discount code for all of you at the United States Naval Institute Press. They have a fantastic selection of books all the way over from air power to naval power, of course. And you can deck yourself in with really fantastic, really fantastic literature there for the holiday season or get something for your friends or family members. If you know anybody who's interested in these sort of topics, do check it out. These books and of course selling Schwein for it as well. And if you want to become a member of the Naval Institute, you can do so as well. Uh, you got actually 40% off at that point. So if you're an avid reader that's maybe something to look into but yeah 25% off with the exclusive discount count all the information is also in the description below check it out and deck yourself in with some fantastic holiday reading finally yes yes we are done yes let's go back to the topic we can also see the preponderance of the strategic air power theory in the reactions to the raid while there was of course internal admission and discussion about you know, the things that had gone wrong, there was also a very strong drive to double down on the missions. Hence, for example, why that second raid was flown and the target list of key production items was maintained. General Arnold nevertheless sought to put a positive face on things. He argued that the losses were worth the goal, since Schweinfurt's production was essential to the Germans' war effort. Arnold also sought to reiterate the American commitment to precision bombing pointing out that the bombing was undertaken with the care and accuracy of a marksman firing a rifle at the bullseye. A true re-evaluation of strategic bombing did not occur. Looking at the overall approach to strategic bombing during World War II, O'Mara makes a valuable point that strategic bombing itself was not called into question, just how it was conducted. While the pre-war doctrine shaped how the system was used in the opening stages of the bombing campaign against Germany, Failure to achieve the desired results with the system as constructed forced a re-evaluation of the underlying ideas about how the system should be used. While the mission had put a dent into the bomber offenses by temporarily halting deep penetrations, it did not cause a questioning of strategic bombing by itself. Schweinfurt had the potential to cause such a chance, but in the face of 20 odd years of doctrinal feedback loops, the chances were slim indeed, as Brian Wall explains in his recent publication Selling Schweinfurt. Blame for the air campaign's lack of progress could fall in one or all of three places. Lack of resources, which would reflect poorly on General Arnold's in his role as force provider. The Air Corps Training School's doctrine as a failing experiment, which might jeopardize the need for independent air power. Or aid Air Force's command's lack of creativity and flexibility as it had underutilized and underperformed the forces commanded. Arnold chose to articulate the third. There are perhaps three reasons for the failure of re-evaluation. First, the doctrine had itself become self-evident and provided a powerful antidote for change. The result of pre-existing beliefs, once organized and established, have a staying power in the face of new information that one might not expect. Second, the results of the operation in terms of damage inflicted was unclear. As long as it could not be definitively proven that Germany had sustained little damage in face of the significant bomber losses, so long air power theorists could still point to crew reports and reconnaissance pictures and conclude whatever they wanted from it. A problem that continues even today in terms of bomb damage assessments. The August Schweinfurt raid had not achieved the level of destruction either the targeting theory demanded or the intelligence organizations expected. The mediocre performance with its inconclusive results had neither validated nor invalidated the ball bearing industry as a viable target. And finally, the introduction of long range escorts and temporary or minor adjustments to target selection facilitated a continuation of the bombing offensive, together with the narrative that ultimately these minor changes allowed bombing to finally find its true form. The disaster at Schweinfurt stands in a direct line from the origins of the concept of American strategic bombing over to the actual raid. 
While well, not undisputed within the Army Air Force itself, the salience of the doctrinal assumptions led the force down that path by which a mission such as this one had become inevitable. It is thus not surprising that it was not framed as a failure of strategic bombing in itself, but rather as a failure to prepare or incorporate certain secondary enabling capabilities that who ensure that the strategic bomber actually delivers the expected. In the end, US and British bombing certainly contributed to Germany's defeat, but they fell far short of the expectations of air theorists. How much? Well, historians still argue on that point and I don't think we will ever really stop. But one thing is certain, a knockout blow that defeated Germany was not delivered by air. And it is questionable whether it really exists. And yes, of course, I'm absolutely aware of the fuel and oil discussion and A-bombs. But that again is another discussion. Big thank you to patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Also make sure as you're leaving this video, go via the description to the Naval Institute's Press's website and grab yourself that 25% uh, discount on their whole book portfolio. Uh, they've got some fantastic books there for uh, you to check out. And isn't it cool that we actually have an ongoing partnership with a fantastic publisher like the Naval Institute Press? Yes, it is. We're absolutely not reliant on any sort of freaking mobile game that keeps sending me an email every single week. I don't want you. I want the Naval Institute Press because they actually give you something that is worth it. Books with 25% off. So make sure you get yourself a copy there and have a great day and see you in the sky.